Let's turn to the book of Matthew chapter 25 and take a reading from there. Matthew chapter 25. And this will be my text throughout this month. I may have a few things to it. But Matthew chapter 25, let's start from verse 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. And he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he is gone. He entrusted what? His money. Who was talking here? Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. So Jesus was the one giving this parable. And I want you to pay attention to it because we have so much to learn from this portion of the Bible. So Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is alike. Jesus was trying to tell them how the kingdom of heaven operates. How many of you think that that is important? Right? He was going to describe to them how the kingdom of heaven, how it works. So he said, it's like a man who called his servants, gave them money, and then he left. All right, let's continue. He gave one five bags of silver, another two bags of silver, and another one bag of silver, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who had received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. The servant who had two bags of silver also went to work and he earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. And after a long time, somebody say a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Mm. How they had used whose money? Whose money? His money. The servant whom he had entrusted, the word entrust is a powerful word. I hope I get there today. If I don't, I'll touch on it next week. But the servant who had been entrusted with five bags of silver came forward with five more. And he said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. Somebody said to invest. He didn't give it to them to keep. He said, you have given me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise and said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let us celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. You see the pattern? The five guys said to invest. The second guy who had two bags also said to invest. And I've earned two more. So the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this little amount. So now I will give you more responsibility. Let's celebrate together. Exactly what he said to the guy with five, he said to the guy with two. Then the servant, who was the third one, with one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops where you didn't plant and gathering crops where you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant or gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little that they have will be taken away from them. Shall we pray? Father, we ask for the short time that we have today. Open our eyes of understanding. Flood our hearts with wisdom. Let our eyes see. Let our ears hear. Let our hearts understand. Give us a word, an instruction, a direction. Inspire our hearts. God, guide us. Lead us, we ask. Sweet Holy Spirit, breathe upon this word. Let our lives move forward. And let your word transform and change our thinking forever. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody says... Everybody says a bigger... Amen. Amen. 
Matthew chapter 25 is one of the scriptures that I love a lot. Several years ago, I think it must have been about 14 or 15 years ago, I worked for a company. Uh, then I, I, I met this man through another business that I had done, another work company that I worked for. And I, I invited me to come work for him. And then I started working with him. But then the name of his business was quite interesting. He called the name of the company, even though the company was doing business in another trade name. But the company that owned the business itself was called Verse 29. So I used to wonder, how does a man look and name a company, verse 29? So one day I walked up to him and said, sir, this is verse 29 of what book or what chapter? So that was how the guy said to me, it is Matthew chapter 25. And I said, so what is in verse 29? I went to look it up I, and I did a study on it because it was quite interesting that a man will call the name of his company, verse 29. And I found out that it's exactly where it is that we read the last verse. That he that has, what shall be given unto him? But he that does not have, even what the little that he has will be taken away from him. And God gave me understanding over a period of time. And it will form the basis of the conversations that we're going to have for the next few weeks. But let's start from the very beginning. Somebody said the beginning. I like beginning. Anything that I want to look for the beginning, I go look in the book of Genesis. And so I saw in the book of Genesis chapter 1 that God made man. Oh my God, there's so much to unpack. I'm, 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 I'm trusting Jesus to deliver on this, some of these truths, but I'm not going to be under pressure. Whatever I can deal with today, we'll deal with. Whatever we cannot deal with, we'll continue next week. Glory to God. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says that God made man. And after God had made man... God did something very instructive. He blessed man. Somebody say blessed man. Oh, come on, say like you mean it. Say he blessed man. I found that that the blessing of God came upon man before any cause came. What it means is that the blessing came before the any curse ever came. The first thing that man knew was the blessing of God. God blessed him. And that speaks something about the intention of God to man. If a man is blessed, his life is supposed to look blessed. And so that truly uh, was something that I kept thinking in my head. If God blessed man, then why does man struggle? I looked at the blessing and I see that in the blessing, the Bible says he blessed man and said, be fruitful. Then he went further and said, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. So the plan and the purpose of God for man is that he is blessed. And the manifestation or the expression of that blessing is that a man be fruitful. And as he is being fruitful, continues in that journey and begins to multiply his fruitfulness. Until the fruitfulness has become so multiplied that it can now replenish the herd, and then it gets to a point that it subdues everything. So I have a few talking points. Number one, the original purpose of God for man was for man to be blessed. The original purpose of God for man is for him to live a life that is blessed. Why would God want man to live a life that is blessed? Let's go to the original beginning of all beginning. Why did God make the earth in the first place? The earth is supposed to be an extension of heaven. The earth is supposed to be a colony of heaven. God made the heavens and he rules in the heavens. So he created the earth that heaven will colonize the earth and earth will reflect what it is that is happening in heaven. Are you guys following me this morning so far? So if earth is to reflect the heavens, it means what you see in heaven, you must see where? On earth. It means our headquarters or our home country, like we call it in a citizenship program or in a citizenship language, is that our home country is supposed to be reflected 
on the company, the country that is being colonized. Do you agree with me so far? Now, I look at the scriptures and I see that heaven is paved with gold. Heaven is such a beautiful place, such a wealthy place. If you do not like gold or you don't like money, please don't go to heaven. Because there is absolutely nothing in heaven that looks like poverty. Go check the scriptures. Heaven is such a massively beautiful place that when people visit heaven or when we get to heaven, we'll just be opening our mouth like this. In fact, Jesus said, I go to prepare mansion. That's what the scripture calls it. So the, maybe the first word of mansion ever is <laughs> in the Bible. Praise God. Heaven is a beautiful place. Now, if the purpose of colonization is to extend what is is in the own country to the colony, then earth is supposed to look like heaven. So God made man and God said to man, be fruitful. I have provided everything on earth to make you replicate what it is in heaven and make the earth to look like heaven. So poverty is supposed to be a strange thing for the citizens of heaven. Anybody that is a citizen of heaven, how many citizens of heaven do I have in the house this morning? We are all citizens of heaven. Everybody that is a citizen of heaven, whatever is not in heaven is not supposed to be. Do you know that the United States of America has a lot of embassies all over the world? And do you know that all the guys that live abroad or in those embassies or in those countries, they do not live by the economy of those countries. They live by the economy of the United States. They are paid in dollars. They are not paid in the local currency of the country where they are. They are health insurance. They are family members. Everything that is provided to them is provided to them based on the economy of who? Of the home country. So why are the children of God, the citizens of heaven, not fully reflecting the image of heaven? In fact, let me take it a little further to say, it is a disgrace on any kingdom that its citizens look poor. Oh, no wonder the Bible says that he delights in the prosperity of his servants. Because it is a disgrace on the king of a kingdom when his citizens do not reflect the wealth of that particular kingdom. Are you guys following me so far? The king takes responsibility for the prosperity of his people. The king is like a custodian of the prosperity of the people, administering it and making sure that everybody in that kingdom benefits from the common wealth. And that's why it's called common wealth. It is the common wealth of the people that the king administers. How wealthy or how good the citizens look speak so well about the administration of the king. Are you guys following me? I'm intentionally taking it easy. Therefore, it is a not an offense for anybody called a Christian to be born poor but it is a disgrace on our own country if you die poor. Since the earth and the citizens of heaven are supposed to reflect the glory in heaven there is a certain standard that is expected of us as born again Christians. The reason I'm taking a lot of time to establish this is because some of us have been brainwashed and made to believe that wealth is truly not for Christians. As a matter of fact, a lot of people in those days, if they want to describe poverty, they will say as poor as a church rat. Now I used to wonder, I used to wonder, why, why is it the church rat? <laughs> why is it why did they not say a musk rat? Amen. But glory to God, the rats in church these days are no longer poor. Even the rats are fat, amen? Because we eat in Global Harvest Church. 
Amen. So they eat from the crumbs. It is an aberration. It is an insult on the king of the kingdom when his citizens do not reflect the true wealth of that kingdom. So, pastor, why are Christians not wealthy? Let me take a few minutes to deal with that and I will give you a few reasons. Number one is because of the wrong thinking that they have. In fact, some of the statements that I've made this morning, some people, is, they are rioting with it in their mind. Oh, no, that's not what I know. Oh, no, that's not what I know. Somebody would even quote a scripture. They say that uh, Jesus was not wealthy when he was on earth. It's a lie. I once preached a sermon, and I have it. I'll preach it one of these days. Seven reasons why to prove why Jesus was not poor on earth. A poor person does not hire an accountant. Jesus had a treasurer. A good guy. Have you seen a poor person hire an accountant before? What, what are they accounting? Jesus wasn't poor. The Bible clearly tells us that when he appointed his disciples, he said that they may be with him. So Jesus had people on staff. Those guys weren't day students. They weren't day students. They were boarding house students. Everywhere Jesus went to, they went. So even if there were only 12 of them, it means Jesus was feeding 12 families. Because these guys had families. Are you following me? When Jesus was to die on the cross, the Bible says that they had to cast a lot to get his clothes. Jesus must have been wearing some nice designers. Amen. Now, who, who cast a lot on the cloth of a poor man? Do you not see that in the Bible? But that's not the sermon for today. Why do Christians, why are they poor? Our understanding of the will and the desires of God helps to change our thinking. And once our thinking changes, our life changes. In Romans chapter 12 verse 2, the Bible says that do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed. Another translation, a more recent translation says, do not live your life according to the patterns of this world. Because even though we are in this world, we are not of this world. We operate by a different standard and by a different economy. Are you following what I'm saying? So he said, do not be conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word that is common to both of the two words, conform and transform, is what? Form. Form. It means that the information that you and I ingest has the potential to form us. What you listen to repeatedly ultimately forms you. Whether you know it or you don't know it. Whether you even believe it or not. And that is why they build a multi-billion dollar industry around advertisements. You wonder why Coca-Cola is still advertising today. Why do they continue to advertise? Everybody knows Coke. Would you not say so? But they still spend several hundreds of millions of dollars every year for advertisements. Entertainment. Why do they do that? Because they need to consistently put the picture in your face in order to form you even without your knowledge or your consent. So whatever you listen to, and that is why I have issues with Christians that would rather spend several hours on the street of Twitter and social media, but no hours on constructive podcasts. Or the word of God that has the ability to transform our lives. If somebody looks at you and say you all the time, wala, 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 all you will be seeing is your dream is wala, wala, wala. You hear people say that, oh, the hustle is real. The struggle is real. You hear it long enough, the Bible says that it forms you. Jesus said in John chapter 6 verse 63, he said that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirits and they are life. Meaning every word you hear has a potential capability 
to form your thinking and once your thinking is formed i can control your life if i want to change the thinking of anybody let me just sit down with them speak to them long enough i will change their life that's how they make terrorists and suicide bombers all they need to do is to speak to them long enough you know you need to hate your country you know what your country has done they did this they did that they brainwash them long enough somebody can leave their father their mother their friends their loved ones and carry a bomb on themselves and go detonate it and kill many people why because of what they've heard if you want to change that person what do you do you change what they are hearing if you ever need to change your life on any area just change what you are hearing glory to god number two reason why christians need to prosper is because jesus paid the price i'm taking it easy this morning well we build it from here next week jesus paid the price it's a solid foundation jesus paid the price second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 if you put that on the screen for me second corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 the bible says that you know the generous grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for whose sake come on talk to me church for whose sake for whose sake i want you to personalize it for whose sake though he was rich yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty he could make us rich jesus was the second person in trinity the word of god himself the creator of the universe pastor is it not god that created all things yet it is god that created it but god created it by his word john chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god through the word were all things made and nothing was made that was made outside of the word so god created everything by what by the word now the same word the second person in trinity was revealed unto us and he came in the form of man by the name jesus and the bible says he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich it means that if you decide not to be rich you have just wasted the resources that jesus paid for The KJV version says, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became, for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Let me show you the amplified version of that scripture. Amplified of that 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. The Bible says, amplified version, for you are recognizing more clearly the grace, okay, let me read this one that you have on the screen. For you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is a function of his kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. In that though he was so very rich, yet for your sakes he became so very poor in order by his poverty you might become enriched which is being abundantly supplied third john verse 2 i wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy so prospereth pastor why are you emphasizing this for some people that have heard it long and long and long long enough to have believed that wealth is not of god you need to change your mind you are wasting the resources that ever made jesus paid the price so that we can be wealthy especially so because the world needs your wealth we need you somebody help me tap your neighbor say we need you you know even jesus when he died he would have remain on the cross without anybody to bury him if there was not a rich person amongst the people that were following him 
It was on the cross there. And they couldn't find, they didn't have a tomb to bury him. It's not today that burial is expensive. Oh. It's been expensive since, hey, amen. You do not know? Burial is expensive. Uh, you will not die young. And that's why I say all Global Harvest Church members must have life insurance. Say, man. Not because I say you will die, but you must have it. You have insurance in your car. Are you praying for accident? But when you get out of your car, you have life insurance. You have car insurance. In fact, when you enter car, you use seat belts. Don't you use seat belt? Are you, are you praying for accident? So why do you use seat belt? You have faith that you will not have accident, but you use seat belt. I have faith that you will not die, but get life insurance. Amen. You know why people cry a lot when somebody dies? I'm telling you. This is finance class, isn't it? Uh -huh. So I can talk some things that I will not talk on a regular summer. When you see people that they are dead like this, I'm like, a lot of time is because of the expenses. Who will now take care of this school fees now? Who will now take care of this mortgage now? Who will now take care of this house rent now? Who will now take care of this now? But if you see somebody that died and they said that there's a million dollars check that is coming, yeah, the Lord give it, the Lord take it. What can we say? Who can question it? I have a protege, one of the guys that I mentor and train, used to work in a bank as a bank manager for one of the very popular banks. And I was talking to him one day and he said, sir, I found out that a lot of my clients, most of them that are whites, Caucasians, said I found out, sir, that vast majority of them, more than 70% of them, became wealthy because a family member left them life insurance. So, but sir, I found out that all of my clients that are blacks, they don't have. Somebody say, Sela. Uh, that is a word for somebody to think about. Let me go back to my sermon. If the kingdom holds all the resources in it, It only gives the resources to those who can use it for kingdom purpose. In that Matthew chapter 25 that we read, I told you to pay close attention to the word entrusted. The money was not their own. The money belonged to the who? To the master. But the master gave it to them in order to do business with it. So pastor, how do we now begin to have this sharp sense that will help us to take advantage of everything that heaven has provided? And today I'm starting with the spiritual dimension of it. Next week, I'm going to talk about management of money itself. How to grow money. And then we'll talk about how to get out of debt. And how to plan your money and increase your money. Before, by this month, your head will be correct. You know, one of my mentors, if I mention his name, a lot of you know him. He said they were moving from one house to another house not in the U.S., in another country that a lot of you know. And so they were packing and packing and packing and packing to be able to move. Like you know how much it is to pack and to move houses even here in the U.S. So he said at some point his house domestic staff, we call them house help, were packing his books and they just kept packing and packing and packing. So the two of them were now talking. They didn't know that Oga was on the stairs coming down. So he said when he heard them talking, he stayed and hearing what they were saying. So one of the house help looked at the other one and said, we don't they pack book. We never pack and finish. Say, how person go read all this book where he had no go correct? 
You know, a study in the United States, this is as far back as 20 years ago, I saw that study, said that every single home in the U.S. at the time that was worth over $200,000 in estimates, every single home that was worth over $200,000 had a library in it. And so it is safe to make a conclusion that it wasn't the house that brought the library, it was the library that bought the house. If you didn't catch that and it just went over your head, you will get it next week. The kingdom owns everything and it is only what is released that we can get. If we understand that the resources belong, because the first or the starting point on this journey, folks, is that from today, I want you to treat every money that comes into your hands, not as something you worked for, but something that heaven provided. You are a citizen. If you have that understanding, it's going to help the way you deal with money. The Bible says that that master gave unto them. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to this. Except for children of God that are not willing to operate by the principles of the kingdom of heaven. If you would become wealthy by the principles of heaven, the first thing you need to establish in your mind is that my money is not mine. It belongs to him. And whatever God cannot get from you, it will not get to you. Anytime the kingdom or heaven releases stuff into your hands, your question should not be, how will I spend it? Your question should be to the home or country, what is this money for? Because he gave it unto them for a purpose. I'll move on. Every citizen must be responsible and accountable for whatever resources that the kingdom releases into their hands. The use and the management of those resources. I will talk about it next week. The reason why, and I begin to wrap it up here today, but the reason why money seems to be a very sensitive subject and a very important thing is because money is so personal. In fact, you know, I was reading the scripture and I saw where Jesus himself, I think it's in Matthew chapter 6. Somebody can find me the right reference. Matthew chapter 6. But Jesus himself said that you cannot serve God and mammon. Have you seen that in the Bible before? Let me try to find it. Or if somebody find it for me. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold on to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. God, Jesus himself, put God and mammon in the same sentence. You know what Jesus just did? He just elevated money even more than Satan. He didn't say God and Satan. He said God and money. Money is so powerful, guys. In fact, in my opinion, the second most powerful thing on earth after God is money. That's why you don't like people to know how much you are earning. You don't like people to see your account balance. That is why people are so tight-fisted about their money. But a kingdom citizen that wants to prosper in this kingdom must have their mind shifted from a sense of ownership to a sense of entrustment. Heaven has no scarcity. And I think I will wrap it up here today. Heaven has no scarcity. Heaven has no scarcity. You can say that a million times. Heaven has no scarcity. There is no poverty in heaven. 
So pastor, why don't people have money? I will wrap with this concept tonight or this afternoon. The reason people do not have money is not because they do not pray. The reason people do not have money is because they do not fast. In fact, let me show it to you. The reason why people don't have money. Go back to that Matthew chapter 25. Give it back to me in verse 14. And then I'll read verse 15. Or give me verse 15. Matthew chapter 25 verse 15. Give me verse 15. I will tell you the reason why people don't have money. Listen to this everybody. Can we all read it out together everybody? One, two, three, go. To one he gave five talents. To another he gave two. To another one. If everyone has no scarcity, what determines what each person gets is the ability to manage it. Look at me, folks. What I'm saying to you this morning by the word of the Lord is that whatever amount that you have today is what everyone has measured you by and said this is what you can handle. You will see therefore that it is a waste of time to pray for money. He didn't give to them according to the resources of heaven. He gave to them according to what? Do you see why unbelievers have stupendous money? Because a lot of you say sometimes, oh my gosh, uh, unbelievers, they shouldn't have anything. They shouldn't, uh, it's not God that gave them. It's not God. If I were God, sometimes I would give unbelievers that can manage the thing better than a believer that cannot manage it. If I were God. In fact, if I were God, I would give people sometimes that are not in church but can manage it well than people that come to church every day. But they are not church, Global Harvest Church members. I'm talking of another church. According to what? I'm telling you, the day I saw this, it changed my mindset completely about money. A kingdom citizen does not seek money. A kingdom citizen builds the capacity to manage money and heaven will release based on the capacity. If you want your income and the abundance and the supply of God to increase, you must therefore make efforts and labor hard to work on your capacity. Listen to me, folks, as I wrap up with this. Every single money that comes into your hands, everyone is standing like this and watching to see how you manage it. I was doing a study yesterday and thinking about my sermon today and I had to confess to the Lord, not as a sinner, but as somebody who has wasted money. I had to say, Father, I repent. Because the Bible says, and Jesus, Jesus talking, he said that master, he delivered unto them according to their ability and then he went away. And then he came back and said, come and give an account of how much it is. He starts first with the mindset of this money does not belong to me. I have been entrusted with it. Number two, I must manage it well. And next week, I will get into some of the hard stuff. A lot of times we see God and know him from the dimension of his sovereignty. But there's a dimension of God that is beyond sovereignty. There's a dimension of God that is a businessman. And the dimension of God that is a businessman is a brutal one. A child of God can cry from now to heaven. I know intercessors that are broke. I know demon chasers that cannot afford to pay the abuse. Yet sometimes you will see an unbeliever that manages money and you see God blessing them. Is it not the same God that makes his son to shine over the unbeliever, the righteous and the unrighteous? Because when it comes to the businessman side of God, God is looking for his own kingdom. I think Pastor Ebola said it last week, or maybe he said it in our closer section when he was talking to us. 
I hope you know, and let me say this to you, Global Harvest Church, that God does not answer anybody's prayer. Let me say it again. God does not answer anybody's prayer. God answers his own prayer. So if your prayer is not aligned with his prayer, it cannot be answered. Jesus taught them how to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That's not the best translation for it. Modern day translation says, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound as long as it is already bound in heaven. Jesus said, It out of my father walketh, so I walk. He said, for whatever I've seen my father do, I do. The result of Jesus was not in just speaking and commanding. It was that he was able to pick in the spirit what heaven has done, align himself to do it, and then he gets cheap results. Are you listening to what I'm saying, Global Harvest Church? So I've seen people that know how to pray and fast. Prayer and fasting does not bring wealth. It is according to their ability. So I want you to go home today and go measure what your net worth is and be plain. There's no point arguing with God. I said, God, I know this is my place right now, but we need to do better. We need to do better. My time is completely gone. But I will say this to you guys. God gives us resources and leaves you with the ability to manage it. Ah, a few years ago, God said to me, I, I stumbled on that scripture and the revelation, the light shook, struck my heart so strongly. I saw in the scripture and I will read it to you next week. I don't have the time today, but in Genesis chapter 1, when God made everything, the Bible says that the tree bearing seed he has given to you and the fruit thereof to consume you can cons you can easily miss the revelation in that scripture but the lord said to me that for every single opportunity that i bring your way your next opportunity is inside that opportunity Your next level of wealth is inside what God is bringing to you today. God said to me, he said, from every income that comes to you, the day you stop taking the portion of it that is supposed to build the opportunity for tomorrow, you'll be hungry in the tomorrow. Every single door that God opens to you, inside that door are other doors. Are you listening to what I'm saying, guys? God said to me, if you do not make the most of what I bring to you today, your next level is inside what you have to do. That's why I wrote this book. I've not even got into this one at all. I wrote this book, Money Matters. It's one of the first books I've written in my life. I wrote, I've only written two books. I published them this year. But I am so, so, so particular about money and kingdom wealth that the very first books that somebody will write, say, they wake up like this, they say, write book. I wrote money. Because I saw so much poverty with a lot of Christians that I vowed I can never be poor. I can never be poor. If you give me hundred million dollars in this church today, I'll tell you the things that we already use the money. We have Project of the Streets coming. You know what? how much we spend on Project of the Streets? Several thousands of dollars every year for people that are homeless. How about you and I build a facility that we take care of people, breakfast, lunch, dinner, of people that are homeless, 
but we do not only provide for their daily income or their daily feeding, but we also do skill acquisition and do entrepreneurial training and help them to run business. I was telling my team over the last week that my goal next year, my goal next year is that as long as the Lord leave it, I will board at least 100 entrepreneurs, at least 100 people that will start their business. And I was telling my team, I said, not only would we train them, but I will also be investing in their businesses. You know, we, we talk about doing God's work and we are looking for money. It's a disgrace on the home country. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Why should outsiders be the one bringing money to do the gospel? One of the last projects that I worked on before I came to the U.S. in Nigeria was a project that was funded by Bill and Melida Gates Foundation. Of course, they paid me well. But when I saw the amount of money that these guys were investing in Africa and in third world countries, if I were God, I would bless them more. If I was God. And those guys now decided to form a team an association of billionaires that have committed themselves to give minimum of 50% of their wealth away. That's the type of association I want, not the stupid ones that is on, all over the place. Are you listening to what I'm saying, guys? I want you to go home today with a sober reflection. Some of you, we have to go before God and say, God, I'm sorry that I've mismanaged the resources. I leave you with this. When God, when the master gave them that bags of silver, one thing he never did was I didn't tell them how to invest it. He left it to their creativity. All he said is that, I've given you this money. Do you agree with me, sir? that it will be very wicked of God to leave them to duplicate and multiply finances if he has not imbued in them the ability to do that. Inside them was the creativity. The guy that had five said, I've turned it around and built another five. The guy that had two said, I've done the same I gave it. Listen to me, folks. Everything that you need, heaven has already provided. It is you that cannot access it because of your limited ability. So throughout this month, what we'll be doing is building that capacity and that ability. Some of you will not go to any fine dining restaurant for the next six months by the time we are done. What are you buying designer for? I was telling a few friends over the week, we went to visit and we're talking about church and then the lady was saying to her, say, ah, this is your church, ah. When we first came like this, they say, ah, designer church. Oh. We don't buy designer from our income. We use the grandchildren of our money to buy the designers. It is the money that the money has produced. Are you listening to me? You use your hard-earned income that is not multiplying to go and buy a Mercedes. It's not Mercedes you bought. It's foolishness that you bought. Every man must learn to live at the assize per time. If the value of your investment is not multiple of the designer, it is foolishness. And you need to go back to God and confess your sins. And say, Lord, I'm sorry. Some of you are living in an apartment that you have no business paying that type of rent. A man must learn to live at his level per time. And there's no shame in being at this level at this time. There's no shame. If all I can afford is Zara, then God be praised. If all I can afford is shame, then God be praised. If all I can afford is Fashion Nova, then Jesus be glorified. If all I can afford, when we came into this country, we had so much money in savings, but we had enough sense to know. Let me tell you this, guys. When we came into this country, my family, back home, I was driving a Mercedes. My wife was driving an Acura. 
When we came into this country, you know what I did? We went to auction and bought two Camrys. My wife looked at me and said, this Camry, we used it 10 years ago. I said, yes, we are back 10 years now. And we will build it again. Are you listening to me? Could I have afforded to buy a Mercedes? Absolutely. We had enough money. We went to Walmart to buy jeans. What are you buying $200 jeans for? What is your problem? What's your problem? You bought that jeans. You bought that car. You pay for that apartment and everyone looks at you and say, you have just disqualified yourself because you don't have the capacity to manage it because you thought it was your money, but it is God's money. I believe that you were blessed. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 that if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that you will be saved. Would you join me as I pray for you today and lead you to make the confession of faith and the prayer of salvation. Say, Father, thank you for the word today. Thank you for your love and for saving me. I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God and you died for me. And therefore, I confess that you are my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. I am now saved, washed in your blood, and I'm born again. Thank you. In Jesus' precious name. If you said that prayer, you have just made the most important decision of your life. I welcome you into the family of God and angels are rejoicing right now. Send us an email. Send us a text. Give us a call. Let us rejoice with you. And I would also love to send you the gift of the Bible and next steps. May the Lord bless you abundantly and keep you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.